Hi, everyone. I'm just about to start. Thank you so much for being with us today. So I'm going to start sharing my screen and then we'll, we'll begin the conference. Okay, so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone joining us. Thank you for tuning in to Front and Off Center, Fashion and Southeast Asia. This is the Documenting Fashion Group Annual Conference for 2023 at the Kotor Research Forum. We are all so glad to have you with us. I would first like to introduce myself. My name is Nadia Wang. I am a lecturer at La Salle College of the Arts in Singapore, where I teach primarily in the School of Fashion. I am also the founding editor of two journalistic platforms. The first, Art and Market, or a &M, launched in October 2018. It is the multimedia platform that presents specialist content on Southeast Asian art, featuring its communities, artistic, curatorial, and business practices. The second, Fashion and Market, or FEM, who is a collaborator for this conference, began in May 2021 as, and is a multimedia platform as well that pre presents specialist content on Southeast Asian fashion, featuring its community's interdisciplinary practices. I pursued both my master's and PhD in history of art at the Courtauld, and I am glad to be back here with this first of its kind conference on fashion and the Southeast Asian region. My training and work as a researcher educator and journalists in both art and fashion have shaped the questions that guide the conference. They are the ones that I have tried and continue to try to answer in my own research, in classes and consultations with my students, and in commissioning and editing stories for my platforms. The first, how do fashion practitioners who have ties to Southeast Asia engage with the self, their local and regional communities, as well as the global fashion system? The second, what are the ideas and values that underpin the work they do? And finally, what are the common threats and unique characteristics that define fashion from the region, if any? The conference features both academic and industry presentations, as all of you would have noticed by now. This is so for a few reasons. It is partly because of the limitations we have in terms of academic research into fashion from the region but mostly it continues the tradition of the annual conference by the Documenting Fashion Group, who collectively see the value of hearing from practitioners in various segments of the industry. I hope that new ideas for research will be sparked by what the participants share today. Here, I would like to introduce what fashion is, for it might include more than we think. For my students tuning in, I know this will be familiar because it is what sets up our classes in cultural and contextual studies in fashion at La Salle. And it comes from Dr. Rebecca Arnold, who started a documenting fashion group and was a wonderful supervisor on my PhD journey, which I completed just last year. Thank you for all your guidance and the opportunities you have facilitated. And thank you for this quote I'm about to read. Fashion is not merely clothes, nor is it just a collection of images. Rather, it is a vibrant form of visual and material culture that plays an important role in social and cultural life. It is a major economic force amongst the top 10 industries in developing countries. It shapes our bodies and the way we look at other people's bodies. It can enable creative freedom to express alternative identities or dictate what is deemed beautiful and acceptable. And it raises important ethical and moral questions and connects to fine art and popular culture. This is an excellent quote to ground what we are about to enjoy and discuss in this conference, which is ordered into nine sessions that try to cover as much of what fashion is and can be as possible. They are fashion curation, fashion history, or as I have named it, fashion time travels, fashion brands, hybridity in fashion, sustainability in fashion, fashion spreads, fashion collectives, where we will focus on the PHX fashion group this time, artists and fashion, and fashion photography and film. This is of course not exhaustive, but it does try to capture and demonstrate the breadth of fashion practices in the region. As I've written in the conference introduction, the gathering over these two days will present research that independently and collectively contribute to efforts to decentralize fashion research. And here I would like to share a quote from the book, Rethinking Fashion Globalization, which was published recently in 2021. I particularly appreciate a line from the afterword written by the editors Sarah Chiang, Erica the Grief, and Takagi Yoko. In knowing and addressing the fashion world as multi-centered, we begin to acknowledge diversity and welcome viewpoints that are different, even oppositional. I like the idea of multiple centers rather than a single one. The conference is based on this idea. 
While Southeast Asia may be considered off-center when it comes to fashion, the title puts fashion in Southeast Asia front and center. I would now like to show a map of the world to situate Southeast Asia, because this is one of the um, main questions I get actually when I present at conferences. Where is Singapore, which is where I'm from? Where is Southeast Asia? And you can see here that it is on the bottom right of this image. Um, and as you can see geographically, and I suppose politically, the region is off center, but that is a kind of center if we take on board the idea of the fashion world being multi-centered. I would also like to acknowledge at this time that there are limitations to putting together a conference that proposes to talk about fashion and apparently all of Southeast Asia. As you can see here, which includes Brunei, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar, the Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, Timor Leste, and Vietnam. We're not going to be able to talk about it all in a single conference, but I do hope that this will be the first of many gatherings to talk about fashion and Southeast Asia. And I'm confident with my fellow presenters that it will be a good start. One of the things that I'm glad to highlight in the conference is the self as an entity and a construct. Traditionally, in academic research, the self is not privileged, and we are taught to write in the third person and to be objective. What I particularly enjoy about fashion research is the subjectivity that can come to the forefront. I refer now to another quote from the Rethinking Fashion Globalization book, which thinks about the individual. It reads makes that it makes clear the power of interaction uh, between fashion practice and theory is a continuum of globally distributed knowledge production where embodied practices in the self-fashioning of identities are felt and interwoven in the daily experiences of identity and belonging. I know it is something that I have had to unlearn, and I know that some of my colleagues and I have discussed this as well, in order to embrace the personal and the riches this provides in research. It is also something that my students have had to do when they undertook their studies in fashion, such as with the image here that has come to represent this conference. It was taken by Jaya Kadir for his graduation project Yalam, which is Malay spelled backwards and pays attention to his identity. Jaya was a student in the School of Fashion at La Salle, and he will tell us more about his work, including this graduation project, in the final session of the conference. For now, I would like to say that stories of the everyday person help to challenge grand narratives, and I hope that the conference also provides examples of methods that fashion researchers have used in order to unearth, record, and unpack these micro stories that challenge and or complement pre-existing information that we have received. I refer now to a quote that has helped me to navigate the inherently interdisciplinary nature of fashion research and to think about how to um, conduct this specifically within Southeast Asia, where fashion research, as I've noted before, is not yet prolific. Go Bing Lan wrote in the essay, Southeast Asian Reflections on Disciplines and Area Studies, in the book, Decentering and Diversifying Southeast Asian Studies, Perspectives from the Region, that it is useful to develop um, theoretical perspectives, which can consider the simultaneity and interaction of the global and the local, the inside and the outside, the old and the new, the center and the periphery, the stable and the unstable, and so on. I would now like to return to my research to demonstrate how I've applied the theories I've shared that have in turn informed my work and to think further about fashion in Southeast Asia more generally. In my PhD thesis titled Accidental Career Girl to Working Mother of the Year, Her World, Women, and the Fashion Industry in Singapore, 1974 to 1989, which I am working on adapting into a book, I used fashion as a lens to examine fragments of the long-running women's magazine in Singapore, Her World, over the 15-year period for a decentered understanding of the evolution of the Singaporean woman from being an accidental career girl to becoming Working Mother of the Year, an award that was organized by the magazine. I simultaneously charted the creation of a fashion industry that pivoted from seeking validation from global fashion cities to establishing itself as the leader of an ASEAN fashion community, such as with the best of ASEAN designers show as seen here, where ASEAN stands for Association of Southeast Asian Nations. This was established in 1967 for cooperation in the economic, social, cultural, technical, educational, and other fields. I employed a necessarily multidisciplinary method of an analysis of archival material based primarily on visual analysis, which forms the basis of my training at the Core Talk, and supplemented this with oral history interviews with editorial staff and collaborators of the magazine in order to tell their micro stories. 
In doing so, I showed how Singaporean women self-fashioned using local and global ideas and commodities of fashion and beauty, including looking towards models and beauty queens. My thesis situated Singapore's nascent fashion industry in the country's ambitious project at the time, and probably still today, of modernization and economic progress. So it not only considered visual and discursive representations, but also located meanings in reality. And by addressing the multifaceted practices of dress or fashion in women's private lives and within the fashion industry, drawing parallels between them and highlighting meaningful interactions and intersections, it also proved the creativity of women and fashion industry participants in Singapore, contrary to previous understandings of their agency. I very much hope that this conference will also showcase and prove the creativity that is inherent in the region. Additionally, my thesis demonstrated that fashion can allow for a more complicated understanding of not only Singapore's fashion industry, but also the lives of Singaporean women and by extrapolation, the medium's potential for the examination of other aspects of Singapore's history. It is also my hope that the conference can show fashion's potential for the examination of other aspects of the histories of Southeast Asian countries. In my professional practice, as I introduced earlier, I run Art and Market or ANM, and I must say that this has a more active community of researchers, curators, institutions, and galleries working together to publish, uh, publish research on the work that's created. With Fashion and Market of Femme, it has been a little more challenging to put out well-researched, accessible content with the producers in the region and also to a small group of audience that we have at AM. I do see this changing bit by bit and um, steadily. So that's good. And I hope that FAM will continue to grow and be a resource for people who are interested in fashion and Southeast Asia. I thought for those of you who may not be familiar with FAM, that you could watch this brief video, which was put together by Sharona Valeska, the content manager of FAM, and uh, an alumna, uh, alumna sorry, from um, La Salle, in celebration of the platform's second birthday, where we rebranded and relaunched the site. You will also see at the end that there is a podcast project that's highlighted titled In the Between, which is where my podcast partner and a presenter at the conference, Daniela Monasteros Tan and I, have recorded over 80 episodes documenting our discussions on fashion, most of it located within Southeast Asia. there's so much to discover if you have not already uh, been to FAM, so I encourage you to do so. Um, at this point, thank you so much for listening to all I've had to say, and I'm so pleased to pass the microphone to the other presenters in the conference. Thank you to Dr. Acacia Finbo at the Kotor Research Forum for working on the conference with me, together with Leila Bambra and Charlotte Roberts. And thank you to Wei Tia, Daniela Monasteros Tan, Fiona McKay, Peter Lee, Kiko Del Rosario, Toton Januar, Tao Wu, Rohaizatu Azar, Sang Tai, Dr. Chomwan Wirawarawit, Dr. Harriet Richards, Sing Yun Shen, Akila Zailan, Dr. Alice Beard, Rima Fabriani, Angeline Wong, Dr. Anne Pearson Smith, Esme Palaganas, Joseph Bagasau III, Triki Lopa, Jakai Sirbut, Wawi Navarosa, Lim Shaowin, Jaya Kadir, um, Gagandeep Singh, which I'm missing from this slide, I apologize, and Sharana Valeska for making this first gathering possible. I wish everyone a most enjoyable conference. Here are my references and here are my contact details. A note that we will have a plenary session at the end of day two where participants will gather as a group to talk over the themes. Now over to session one. Hello everyone. Um... Uh, thank you, Nadia, for such a wonderful introduction to um, this conference. I know this is um, one of the first of its kind, and it's it's such an honour to be able to, to chair not only a session, but the first session. Um, and this session is specifically on um, fashion curation. Um, 
I'm Fiona Mackay and I myself worked as an independent curator within fashion curation uh, for around six years and I recently last year joined the design museum um, and now I'm working on a fashion exhibition due to open this year in September called Rebel 30 Years of London Fashion um, so if anyone happens to be in London from September to January that year uh, this year please do come um, and now without further ado I'm going to introduce you to the first of the two speakers um, which is Yap uh, Uechi hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Hi there. Uh, really, really good to meet you on here. Um, and it's such a pleasure to, to be able to do this over Zoom and have this kind of cross-continental experience. And um, so Wai Chi Yap is an independent fashion writer and curator with a background in fashion journalism and graduating with an MA in fashion curation from the London College of Fashion. Her research interests lie in everyday dress, fashion exhibition histories, and fashion museology. She runs Fashion On Display, which is a Singapore-based independent fashion curation studio and experimental gallery dedicated to exhibiting fashion and everyday dress. Wai Chi's writing has been published in Vogue Singapore, the International Journal of Fashion Studies, Fashion and Market, Female Singapore, and Harper's Bazaar. She has also delivered guest lectures at LaSalle College of the Arts, the National University of Singapore and Yan Yan Technological University. And now without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to you, Wachi. Oh, thanks, Fiona. I'm going to share my screen now. Okay. So um, good morning and good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. Um, I'm really excited to be a part of this conference alongside so many wonderful researchers and practitioners. And thank you again to Nadia for letting me be a part of this. So the title of my presentation today is Fashion on Display, Collaborative Fashion Curating and Experimental Exhibition Making in Singapore. So today, primarily, I will be sharing about my independent curatorial practice through the case study of Fashion on Display, which is an independent gallery and experimental fashion creation studio that I opened here in Singapore in May last year. Uh, and the details of Fashion on Display are there if you are interested in finding out more about us. So uh, this is just a quick overview of what I will be covering in my presentation today. I will begin first by giving a brief overview of fashion curation and museology in Singapore in order to situate the curatorial activities of Fashion on Display. Then I'll take you through the four fashion exhibitions that were staged at Fashion on Display, um, aiming to explore alternative and experimental ways in which fashion and dress can be exhibited outside of the museum and heritage institutions. And last but not least, I will address the logistical and curatorial challenges of running an independent fashion space in Singapore. So to begin, uh, fashion creation in Singapore. This is kind of how I've approached my research in this area. So this is largely inspired by the Exhibiting Fashion Archive um, started by the Centre for Fashion Curation at London College of Fashion and also exhibition maker Jeff Horsley's incomplete inventory of fashion exhibitions. So this is kind of my, uh, my incomplete inventory of fashion exhibitions in Singapore. It is open access uh, and it's hosted on Notion and I'm happy to share the link uh, with everyone after this. Um, but essentially, it's a list of all the fashion exhibitions, at least to my knowledge, um, staged in Singapore since 2004. And you can see that um, it's been categorized into the exhibition type, the title of the exhibition, um, who was curated by, um, just to get an understanding of the curatorial activity that has happened in Singapore since that period. So like most cities, the practice of fashion curating in Singapore resides largely within the domains of established heritage institutions like our national museums. Um, I've highlighted here just three of our museums uh, that have permanent exhibits of fashion and dress. So the first we have the Asian Civilizations Museum, the National Museum of Singapore, and uh, the recently reopened uh, Peranakan Museum. So I'm just going to highlight just a couple of these um, in the interest of time. So for the Asian Civilizations Museum, uh, to my knowledge, I could be wrong with this, but uh, to my knowledge, I think there have been about 14 fashion dress slash textile exhibitions since 2004. Um, again, 
the documentation of fashion exhibitions in Singapore is pretty hard to obtain. So there might be, you know, lapses in this, this uh, information here. But I do want to highlight um, the Guopi Fashion Exhibition, which closed as the museum's top three most visited exhibitions. Um, and since the opening of its permanent exhibit um, of the Fashion Textiles Gallery in April 2020, these are the list of exhibitions that they've staged since. So in the last three years alone, less than three years actually, um, you can see that there have been a huge number of fashion exhibitions, fashion and dress exhibitions, signaling really an increasing rise of interest in fashion in the heritage landscape. I also want to highlight um, the collaboration of LaSalle College of the Arts, which is SG Fashion Now. Um, SG Fashion Now is a collaboration with students from LaSalle, um, where student curators get to pitch an idea to exhibit um, Singapore-based or Singapore fashion designers. And this is really an opportunity for the museum to exhibit contemporary fashion design in the Singapore context, which I think is a very significant move for the museum as well. Um, and this is significant because uh, for the Asian Civilizations Museum, their remit is largely Asian antiquities and design. So for them to sort of move into this foray of um, contemporary Singapore fashion, it is a very pivotal move for the museum. So I just wanted to highlight that as well. Moving on to the National Museum of Singapore. Um, since 2006, there have been nine fashion and dress exhibitions. So if you can do the math, that's really less than one exhibition every few years. So fashion exhibitions at the National Museum of Singapore are incredibly rare. Um, but again, I do want to highlight a few notable exhibitions. Um, the first one was uh, an exhibition called Stylo Milo, um, staged in 2006. This I thought was very significant because this, to my knowledge, I think the one of the only um, exhibitions that has explored menswear in a Singapore context, especially at the National Museum. Um, another one was Christian Lacroix de Costumia in 2009. This one was a traveling exhibition that was imported into the museum. So uh, the National Museum of Singapore does have a combination of both uh, you know, objects from the national collection and also imported traveling touring exhibitions. Um, they also had this very significant exhibition called In the Mood for Chung Sam, Modernity and Singapore Women in 2012 that explored the evolution of the Chung Sam in Singapore fashion history. Um, in terms of what is currently on display in their national, in their permanent exhibits, uh, these are the galleries that currently have dress on display. So they have the Crown Colony, which looks at dress from 1819 to sort of pre-war um, to modern colony from the 1920s. 20s to 1930s, you have Growing Up, which kind of looks at the um, experience of childhood and nostalgia in Singapore. And last but not least, they have Voices of Singapore, which kind of looks at the cultural out outputs of Singapore and how dress kind of fits into that. Um, so, however, in recent years, apart from our national heritage institutions, Singapore's fashion curation landscape has also diversified. So we've really seen an emerging interest in fashion and dress in independent art spaces, such as Grey Projects and Supper House. So uh, I've highlighted three very recent um, exhibits slash art uh, projects that have emerged in independent art spaces in Singapore very recently over the last three years. The first one is Dress Address, uh, stage at Grey Projects, which is an independent uh, art gallery based in Chiang Baru in Singapore. And this exhibition essentially explored the idea of queerness through the works of four artists, looking at clothing as the main medium to explore that. Um, the second exhibition called The World is Flat After All, this is not a fashion exhibition, but it did have a pretty significant collection of um, Comedy Garçons, very iconic collection from fall 2012. And um, the last one, the last image that you see on your far right, that is called M's Boutique, um, curated and conceived by Daniela Monasteros Tan, who's presenting after me. Um, and this was a really fascinating exploration of sort of the working woman and the professionalization of women and fashion's role in that through the case study of M's Boutique, which is a store uh, in um, a mall in Singapore called Peace Center. So with the exception of permanent exhibits found in our national museums and opportunities um, to sort of experience fashion in a cultural, educational or artistic context, opportunities to do so are really quite limited outside of our museums um, and these independent art spaces. Some exceptions include sort of one-off events or festivals held by organizations such as um, the Singapore Arm of Fashion Revolution, 
uh, sorry, Singapore Revolution, um, which features sort of a range of fashion adjacent activities and events such as mending workshops, uh, live drawing sessions, walking tours, um, sort of very interactive participatory sort of events. Um, but apart from these one-off opportunities, um, sort of uh, experiences to, to engage with fashion in sort of that conceptual um, artistic manner are really quite rare outside of these spaces. So that brings us to fashion on display. Uh, so fashion on display, like I mentioned, uh, is a Singapore-based independent fashion curation studio dedicated to exhibiting fashion and everyday dress. Uh, we are conceived as a year-long curatorial experiment and essentially we aim to generate both accessible conversations uh, and engaging discourse around fashion and dress through exhibitions, workshops, publications and collaborations. Um, and really what we hope to do is to provide a platform where fashion is reflected on with rigor, um, celebrated of criticality and ultimately to explore alternative ways of looking at why we wear what we wear. So we had a lease beginning on 24 February 2022, and that lease ended 20 February 2023. And the temporary nature of fashion on display really has been central to what the gallery has been able to produce curatorially. So these are the four exhibitions that we've managed to stage over the span of um, about a year from May 2022 to December 2022. So kind of half a year, really. Um, but these are essentially the four exhibitions. So the first exhibition was called Dressing for the Dream Space. The second one is The Soul of Things. The third one is Capsule 2009. And the last one is called Fitting In. So these are just some more images of the four exhibitions. So each of our shows set out to challenge an aspect of fashion curation. Um, and that really is the governing uh, sort of drive behind each show. So whether that's spotlighting underexplored narratives of fashion, whether that's something as logistical as relying on alternative sources of dress objects, or employing sort of low budget uh, experimental ways of displaying dress, which I'll go, go into more detail in a bit. Um, so it's really about figuring out what the norms of fashion creation are and figuring out how each show can tackle one of those facets and push that boundary in that way. So I'd like to start first uh, with the first exhibition of Fashion on Display. This was called Dressing for the Dream Space. So this essentially marked the debut of Fashion on Display. And it was really important for us, I think, to mark the opening of Fashion on Display um, with a show that looked at everyday dress. Um, so the premise of this exhibition was that we got four um, exhibition goers, um, Four of them are my friends uh, and we got them to each contribute an outfit that they've worn to a museum or an exhibition before. So these were the four outfits that they each chose and this was how it was exhibited in the space. So you can see it's a very cozy and tiny space, it's 300 square feet. Um, it's smaller than most galleries and museums. Um, but as the first show, the curatorial intent of this show was firstly to set the tone for the gallery as a reflexive space for looking at fashion and dress. Uh, secondly, it was to assert that everyday dress is equally significant as fashionable, um, as, fa as equally significant as um, designer clothing and historical clothing. And last but not least, is also to harness the concept of the dream space, um, which is to sort of suggest a more experimental conceptual approach to fashion exhibition making. So the concept of the dream space really came from uh, this seminal text called Dream Spaces, Memory in the Museum by Gaino Kavanagh. And um, this text by Sheldon Ennis called Meet the Museum as Staging Ground for Symbolic Action. And Sheldon Ennis basically conceives the dream space as um, the space that your mind goes to when you enter a museum. So that's, you know, your memories, your childhood memories, nostalgia, um, your grocery list, your to-do list, the evocations that come up when you encounter an object in a museum. So it's sort of a very emotional, um, very elusive kind of space that he coined. And I was interested in how clothing could then become an extension of the dream space. So this also emerged as really a curiosity about the visitor's clothes, because in fashion exhibitions, we are very familiar with seeing clothes that are very spectacular, of historical rarity, of huge cultural value. Um, but I was curious about what we wear to exhibitions. Um, and this is an excerpt from an interview that I did with one of my subjects, uh, Yang Weiping. And she wrote this wonderful essay in the zine that accompanied the exhibition. And she says that hosting our bodies, our chosen ties will flavor our respective experiences. And I love that she said this because it really acknowledges the, the influence of clothing, of 
of the visitor's role also in the exhibition going experience. And as part of the research for this exhibition, um, I interviewed each four of my subjects um, about their habits, their memories, their experiences of visiting and dressing for exhibitions. And what emerged during my interviews with each of them was this shared respect for the exhibition space. So as by extension, um, clothing really became a vessel for them to express that respect for the exhibition space, which I found really interesting. And something that was very common amongst all four of them was that they saw exhibitions and museums as highly social spaces. And this directly influenced what they chose to wear. Um, in other words, they were dressing to be seen in these exhibition spaces. So their clothes were more than just things that, that they put on. They were visual markers of how they chose to present themselves in such a public space for looking. So I think central to sort of my curatorial approach in this exhibition is really the consideration of the treatment of the object and how you place that within space. Um, and something that was quite significant about this exhibition was the use of mannequins. And because these were real life people and real life friends, um, the choice of the mannequins sort of became um, a point of contention that I had to think about very, very consciously. And I like to refer here to a quote by Judith Clark, uh, where she says that um, there are two areas of interest in fashion curation the treatment of the object and the placing of it within space. And at the center, there's always an imagined body, a past real body for which the installation is the surrogate. And she says that the importance of mannequins is to do with a powerful identification, that we both are and are not these made bodies. So I think this is significant because um, the treatment of the body here um, really becomes central because we are representing real life people. And how do we represent um, real people with sort of the surrogate body? You know, and very central to the practice of fashion creating has always been, been this consideration of the body, right? Um, people like uh, scholars such as Elizabeth Wilson and Valerie Steele, they've sort of echoed this idea of the body being sort of an uncanny presence within the museum. And, to, and, and with my visitors, um, what they were expressing to me in this exhibition was that it was very, very uncanny to see themselves reflected as a mannequin wearing their own clothes. So I thought that was very interesting in terms of seeing the mannequin not just as an apparatus of display, but also an intellectual issue of interpretation and contextualization. Okay. So this was our second exhibition called The Soul of Things. Uh, this highlighted uh, the work of designer Lilia Yip, and we featured six garments from her collection. And this was actually the third stop for the exhibition. Um, and uh, yeah, so as you can see, the exhibition featured a dance film um, and another film that's not, not playing right now, um, six garments and two photographs by fashion photographer Ethan Lai. So the main curatorial approach to this exhibition was that we wanted to get um, local fashion practitioners to respond to the work of Lilia um, in order to contextualize her work for a local audience. So there were three commissions, three um, creative responses to Lilia's work. Um, the first one is a film called Identities by Jaya Kader, who is presenting tomorrow. Um, my slide will change. Yes. I'm sorry. Okay, yes. So this is the film by Jaya. And then the second response was a response by Ethan Lai, who is a fashion photographer. Um, so he shot these two photos. Um, and the third response was a dance film by Angeline Wong, who is also presenting tomorrow. Um, so with these three sort of responses to Lilia's work, I think what emerged as um, really the takeaway from this exhibition was this idea of fashion curating as an interdisciplinary craft. So I'd like here to reference um, Maria Luisa Frieza's quote from The Creator's Risk in Fashion Theory, where she says that with fashion curating, she's fascinated by the relationship between fashion and other disciplines and the ways in which a single garment or fashion photograph or feature in a magazine can immediately relate us to the major themes of human consciousness, to dreams, to obsessions, and all the implications of culture and society. So I think with this exhibition, um, what I was hearing from visitors who visitors at this exhibition was that they managed to respond and engage with fashion better through the lens of another discipline that was outside of clothes, whether that was film, dance, or photography, the inclusion of these disciplines allowed them to sort of access fashion in a way that they've never did before. And I think in a very sort of uh, curatorial sense, the inclusion of fashion film as well, seeing sort of moving and sound and music in the space, it also seemed to add a very atmospheric and affective element to the exhibition. OK, 
you. So this was our third exhibition. This is called Capsule 2009. And this wasn't curated by myself. It was actually co-curated by Daniela and Daniela Monasteris Tan and Josiah Chua. So this exhibition featured over 50 garments, magazines, and ephemera from Singaporean designers in the 2000s. And they essentially took 2009 as a prompt, um, highlighting designers who first launched their labels independently as part of a fashion incubator called Paco Next Next. So this wasn't meant to be a retrospective of any kind, but more of a personal archive of objects that essentially serves as uh, an archive of, you know, uh, Singapore fashion design during this time. So what was significant about this particular exhibition was the inclusion of a garment analysis section. So um, as part of this exhibition, um, Danella set up a garment analysis workshop um, at a corner, at the corner of the, the gallery, where people had prompts that they could fill in, sort of observing the, the garments um, in detail, sketching it, answering questions, you know, what would uh, this garment tell us um, about, you know, single fashion in 10 years, for example. Sorry, just a gentle reminder, you have two minutes left. Thank you. Just wrapping up now. Um, yeah, so with this exhibition, I think the main takeaway was that the permission to touch dress objects serves a huge educational potential. And lots of students came into the space. They really enjoyed sort of touching the objects, putting them on um, and learning about the objects through touch. Okay, and uh, last but not least, this was our final exhibition that closed the space. Uh, this was called Fitting In and was a self wardrobe study by artist and fashion photographer Devin Kusuma. And essentially, this was a wardrobe study um, of his own where he sort of looked at gender essentialism through his wardrobe and he interspersed it with archival photographs that he took from 2017 to 2022. Um, so, this was the exhibition. We had some pieces of his wardrobe on display. And we also had um, over 160 photographs of every single article of clothing in his wardrobe. And interspersed were um, posted captions written in his own handwriting and in his own voice. Um, and this was, uh, I think, really sort of a really nice autobiographical project that wrapped up um, fashion on display. Okay. So I think to address the challenges of running a space like fashion on display. Really, they are two pronged. The first one is logistical, so things to do with manpower, sourcing objects and mannequins, AV technical issues, visitor signups, because we are a very small space. So we one have minute left, thank you. Of, um, of people coming into the space. And in terms of the curatorial challenges, um, it really was about um, the access to dress and fashion objects that are typically perceived as valuable. Um, although I will say with regards to the curatorial challenge, um, it really allowed us to define or redefine the value when it comes to dress objects. So unlike a traditional museum, the conceptual and curatorial treatment of our objects became really the main draw of FOD's programming, not so much their rarity. Okay, and if I just, this is my final slide. So I think as an independent space, what Fashion on Display has allowed us to do is to privilege the lens of fashion and really to explore the emotional, personal and autobiographical facets of fashion and dress. Um, it's really carved a space that has allowed visitors to contemplate their relationship with fashion and dress through various lenses, whether that's through the practice of fashion design or sort of social cultural aspect approach such as Capsule 2009 um, or sort of a more autobiographical approach like Devon's exhibition. So I kind of like to think of fashion on display as an expanded dream space in that sense where these four, although very short and temporary exhibitions that we've managed to illuminate sort of the associations memories and evocations that fashion conjures within the four walls of fashion on the spin. And that is it for me. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Waiji. That was fantastic. Um, so now I'm just going to introduce you to our second pre presenter, Daniela Monasterios Tan. Um, so Daniela is a fashion lecturer, researcher and curator based in Singapore. Hi, Daniela. Um, in 2019, she became a fashion podcast. She started a fashion podcast in the vitrine with fashion historian, Dr. Nadia Wang, an experimental art and fashion collective, A Stubborn Bloom with artist Stephanie Jane Burt. And in 2011, she co-founded fashion collective Mashup. Monasterius Tan has assisted curators and archivists in research, archiving and costume mounting. And these include exhibitions at the Barbican, the Frida Kahlo Museum, Pali Galleria, Victorian Albert Museum, and the Westminster University Men's Archive. Thank you, Daniela. Take it away. 
Thank you, Fiona. So good to see you again. <laughs> Likewise. Okay, so here's my screen. Hi, everyone. Um, from Hello from Singapore, where I am presenting from today. Thank you for tuning in, and I'm really excited to share my work with you today. Um, my name, as uh, Fiona has introduced, is Daniela Monasterio Stan, and I am a fashion lecturer at La Salle College of the Arts, Singapore. I have a background in fashion design and fashion curation, but I tend to use the term researcher uh, to try and encompass everything that I do. This presentation will look at projects that I have been working on since 2020. Through researching fashion and archives, I have been able to understand my city and grow with the creative networks around me. So putting together this presentation really allowed me the space to think about the links in my practice. And I've titled this talk, A Collective Memory of Fashion, to allude to the idea of collections, collectivity, and remembrance. So I will begin with some of the inspirations behind my thinking and how they inform um, the three projects that I will be sharing with you today. I will end with some thoughts on how fashion curation can be a way for us to think about fashion beyond commerce and its entanglements with our collective memory of people and places. So one of my first practical projects in my master's in fashion curation at London College of Fashion was a collaborative project where we were given access to the Central St. Martin's Museum and Study Collection. My collaborator, Audrey Hayes, and I were drawn to this box of 100 folded t-shirts designed by Mao Usami. The t-shirts get progressively larger so as to accommodate 100 layers over one another, creating a really oversized and heavy silhouette. The effect is only visible if you are able to dress or wear the t-shirts yourself. So this was one of the first projects in which I was able to handle an archival object physically. And so we video recorded ourselves dressing the mannequin, highlighting the privileged position that curators have in being able to handle and provide access to knowledge. As part of my studies, I was also introduced to Jules Brown's material culture analysis and Ingrid Mida and Alexandra Kim's object-based research methods. Since I have a background in fashion design as well, this method of slow looking with a structured intention really appealed to me to understand construction and make. As a result of this, my master's thesis departed from mended objects found in archives, which I exhibited as part of my graduation show, as you can see here. Unfortunately, most of the time, I don't actually have access to archival objects. So the idea of fictionalizing the history of objects has been a way around this. I have this lecture that I do with my students titled Fictional Archives. And one of my biggest inspirations has been Orhan Pamuk's Museum of Innocence. It is a museum in Istanbul, which blurs the lines between fact and fiction, the personal and the national. All the objects were found in vintage markets in Istanbul, but their provenance was part of Pamuk's character building for a novel of the same name. Objects were utilized as proxies, as stand-ins stand for the real thing. Rather than being insular, this fictional personal narrative of one man's obsession and love becomes universal. And to me, the museum also becomes a love letter to the city of Istanbul itself, its people, its history, and its urban landscape told through these objects. Visiting the museum and seeing the arrangement of objects in the vitrines really moved me. And it really cemented the idea that although the provenance of objects can be fictionalized, objects are still very strong carriers of time and memory and story. After all, all objects are designed to portray the style, the taste, technology, and beliefs of the culture that they are made in or made for. In the entrance to the museum, Orhan Pamuk placed a manifesto for museums. And one of his provocations that has stayed with me is quoted here. 
that the future of museums is inside our own homes. Uh, this really resonates with what Dr. Dr. Nadia Wang has mentioned in the introduction. And so my next three projects take this as one of their departing points. Home Economics with a Stubborn Bloom is a research project that I conducted with artist Stephanie Jane Burt under the collective name A Stubborn Bloom. The research that we conducted we, um, took uh, well, sorry uh, that we conducted was then presented as a short film, as well as an installation and a zine. The film is a restaging of instructional text from home economics textbooks used in Singapore and Malaysia in the 1970s, and the film consists of three chapters that outline the correct manner for personal grooming, housekeeping, and entertaining. We found some of these origi original home economics textbooks in the library and utilizing archival images, oral history recordings and articles, we found the ways that the process of gendering in Singapore happened early on through this subject in schools. Once women entered the workforce, home economics became a way to impart knowledge that mothers would have given to their daughters in the domestic household. The study of home economics or domestic science has always centered around providing education for women and improving their lives and the lives of those around them. Of course, what this education looked like and what was considered suitable for, for women to study was highly dependent on the social ideals of the time. So as a fashion researcher, what I find fascinating is also the link between women's education and the rise of fashion studies in Singapore because home economics would have been one of the first ways that young women would have been exposed to fashioning themselves by making clothes and thinking about their appearance and grooming. These are some objects that I purchased on eBay as um, fictional objects to include into our archive of home economics. A young woman was taught not only how to cook, budget, finances, and keep the home beautiful, but also how to groom, sew, and care for garments. The proliferation of consumer goods and the way that they were marketed to women in the 70s through these fashionable illustrations and advertisements can be seen in the packaging of this steam iron and hair curler from Brother. My next project titled The Sales Girl Who Became Boss was a commission by DEC, a photography gallery in Singapore. And um, the curator Gwen Lee responded to the upcoming demolition of a mall in Singapore's shopping belt called Peace Center. Many of you might know that in Singapore, the lifespan of many buildings is under 100 years, if that at, at all. And the curator matched different artists to tenants in the mall. So she matched me with a small boutique that sold women's wear called M's Boutique, which had been in the mall since 1976. When I first met the shop owner, Emily Chung, um, the one in yellow, she showed me a large notebook in which she had ar archived every newspaper clipping and article from her early days in business. I was amazed by the fashion genealogies to be found in them. In one of the editorials, M's dresses are uh, featured alongside garments by local manufacturer Bibi and Baba. As fashion historian Dr. Nadia Wang notes, Bibi and Baba found success by globally manufacturing garments for the likes of Macy's, Gaps, and Marks and Spencer's back then. M's Boutique is an example of a sm small scale shop owner that did not have large international aspirations, but just wanted to serve her everyday customers locally and regionally. Emily Cheng opened her first store in Chinatown, and by 1979, she was employing 22 sewers, five cutters, and six sales girls. That same year, local women's wear magazine Her World dedicated a feature to the success of Emily's stores in an article titled The Sales Girl Who Is Now Boss of Two Booming Boutiques by Chris Yap. As she told the journalist, Emily chose to serve, quote, the neglected group, the conservative clients, mostly office workers like clerks, teachers, and nurses, end quote. 
The woman whom Emily chose to cater to was a new demographic that began joining the workforce in the 70s in Singapore. And by 1976, women made up almost 40% of the labor force. They were still performing the bulk of domestic work, yet keeping their primary roles as wife and mothers on top of their labor participation. So women were really being pulled in different directions with many women's magazines joining public debates around the role of women in the household. With disposable income, dress and fashion became the new armor that women would choose as they entered newly created spaces where they had to assert their professionalism and competence. So I chose to recreate some of these ads and professions in my video installation. I also looked to archival images of Singaporean working women to create these characters, such as the one you see here. I also used part of my budget for production to purchase clothes from M's boutique and style myself in them. And I utilized her newspaper advertisements as prompts for gestures and styling too. You can see me here in front of a green screen. Um, the videos I created were mounted onto the heads of mannequins, and I used the language of visual merchandising to create decals for the store using her font. In a snapshot, the installation highlights Emily's story as part of the national narrative of women's lives, social expectations, and labor policies set in Singapore since the 70s. Uh, many of my students, friends, and the general public came for the two-week-long exhibition, and they got to speak and interact with Emily Cheng herself. The project was super fun, and it was also near to the end of Emily's tenure at the mall as well. So this is an image of the boutique a few months after my installation was done, and Emily has since retired as well. Uh, Peace Center has met its fate, and after 50 years of operation will be demolished. So my installation was really a snapshot archive of Emily, Ching, Emily Chung's work in the larger narrative of women's lives and fashion in Singapore. The last project that I will be sharing with you today is a collaborative fashion exhibition held at Fashion on Display, which, which you has um, introduced earlier. Um, and the idea for it came um, because of conversations I had with fashion creative and collector Josiah Chua, who is also my friend and classmate uh, back in school. I wrote a piece in 2021 for Fashion and Market in which I interviewed him about his collection. And we titled it Capsule 2009, which highlights designers that were active in the 2000s, as well as the first batch of designers from business incubator Parco Next Next, which ran from 2010 to 2014. It was, as which he mentioned, not an exhaustive retrospective, but rather really anchored on Josiah's personal archive of objects and our memories of that time. So this project was super special to me because I got to work with Josiah as well as with Chi, who founded the gallery, and my friend, art director, Pixie Tan, whose talent uh, was used to contribute to the visual language of the show, as well as the worksheets for uh, object-based analysis. Um, this is them on the screen setting up the show. So you can see it was super DIY. Here are some photographs of the exhibition, which were sectioned according to a very short genealogy of independent fashion design in Singapore, starting from the early 2000s and ending with the early 2010s. Sadly, many of these labels are actually no longer active, but in a really small city like Singapore, many designers often become lecturers like me, mentors or cross over to adjacent creative disciplines. What I loved most was that many of these garments, magazines and ephemera are really testament to a collective desire for fashion expression. And they show the aesthetic sensibilities constraints such as the weather and the social zeitgeist of Singapore. All the garments that couldn't be shown on mannequins were also hung on racks as a study collection. We had guided worksheets which were designed by Pixie and they took Mida and Kim's object-based approach as a reference. Visitors were encouraged to pick their favorite garments and fill up the observation sheets. 
And this has created another layer to Josiah's archive, um, which is super lovely as well. Um, in some of the worksheets, we see anecdotes such as I'm pulling one out from Wei Chi again, which says, quote, my little sketch of a Pauling Ning top from the study collection. I remember seeing her label in Parco Next Next when I was still a student in 2013, doing my first research on local fashion in my school uniform, end quote. Capsule 2009 also included a panel talk with Josiah moderated by Wei Chi. It felt like a collective remembering of designers and a fashion genealogy that has not been archived. Some of the original designers visited with their families, um, as you can see here on the right, and we had not seen each other in years. It was really a ground up initiative with a lot of heart um, and totally DIY. I feel like we really achieved our desire for a collective appreciation of creative labor and connection in Singapore. I am really privileged in my job as an educator to have a wide reach into the next generation of fashion creatives. In the closing week of the show, we had students coming in to see it as part of their curriculum. So I'm super grateful for my amazing colleagues at LaSalle and all the support that this community in Singapore um, grants me. And as we speak about fashion curation in Southeast Asia, I would like to end this presentation with Orhan Pamuk's um, manifesto as a provocation. He says, we had epics, representation, monuments, histories, nations, groups, and themes, large and expensive. We need novels, expression, homes, stories, persons, individuals. We need small and cheap. I hope some of you are inspired to dig into your wardrobes and your friends' archives to see what other fashion stories there are about your family, your community, your city, or your country. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to meeting some of you. This is my Instagram account where I am most active. We're going to move into the second session now um, called Fashion Time Travels. Okay, I'm just gonna give myself one minute. Okay, so um, welcome to the second session of um, Front and Off Center Fashion and Southeast Asia at the Kotor Research Forum. Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon or morning, wherever you are. My name is Wei Si Yap, and I'm an independent fashion writer, curator, and educator. Um, if you were here for our first session, you would already know who I am. Um, but I will be the chairperson for, the, for this session on fashion time travels. The presenters will each give a 15 to 20 minute presentation. Then we'll have a joint Q&A sec uh, segment where you can type in your questions for the speakers. And I would now like to introduce our first speaker for this segment, Peter Lee. So Peter Lee is, hello. Hi, Peter. Um, Hi. Peter Lee is an independent researcher and the honorary curator of the NUS Baba House, a historical house museum managed by the National University of Singapore. Since 1998, he has curated exhibitions and authored essays and publications on various aspects of Peranakan heritage. His fashion-related work includes Sarang Kabaya at the Peranakan Museum in 2011, and a book on the subject shortlisted for the Singapore History Prize in 2018. In 2016, he co-curated Singapore Sarang Kabaya 10 and Style at the Furukoka Art Museum and the Shoto Museum in Tokyo. He was also the host of two seasons of The Mark of Empire, a documentary broadcast by Channel News Asia in Singapore in 2020 and 2022. Okay, without further ado, I'm passing the time over to you, Peter. So good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my presentation is based on uh, trying to sort of think of Singapore um, not as a new city, but as the heir to a really uh, sort of centuries old um, series of port cities, hybrid port cities, um, uh, where things have been, um, when Singapore was founded, we didn't really have people just sort of like coming in as a, like a, all these different monocultural people coming in. What we actually experienced was people who had been so mixed for a long time coming together in 1819, bringing with them, um, you know, these centuries of living in mixed 
uh, urban societies for a long time. Um, the other notion that I'm trying to promote is the idea that um, uh, Singapore and Southeast Asia are not on the periphery of bigger cultural worlds like India and China or Europe. We are actually at the epicenter of a sort of a, the global world. We were perhaps the first globalized uh, society, the, the region with the first globalized societies. Uh, and with this presentation, I hope to convince you that this might be the case. Um, sorry, excuse me. Um, so the, the title same but different uh, encapsulates the two paradoxical characteristics. One, the demand for the same luxury textiles and garments. It's sort of the Birkenbag syndrome then in the past. Uh, whatever city in whatever island and country, uh, luxury goods circulated and you had this demand for very similar things whenever they came out uh, and were uh, exported into our region. The other interesting thing is the inconsistent and unconventional manner in which textiles and garments were used. Luxury goods were often not uh, used in the way that they were made for. And um, often in, in museum studies, we, don't, we, we often pay a lot of attention on the origins, the makers, the creators, and not how they were uh, used and misused and used differently uh, in, in varying contexts once they uh, left the workshops. And this would include the idea of um, the secondhand, secondhand or secondary market where uh, the life of an object continues and changes in fact. So um, uh, when we think of what happened here, I, th these were, uh, were also very, very important issues. Um, I have here a picture of Singapore uh, painted in 1837 and uh, the early pictures encapsulate this idea of the port city uh, boats with people from all kinds of different nations and ethnicities. Um, oops, sorry. Um, yeah, uh, the, the idea of the, the plural port city goes back to very old records, uh, manuscripts of the history of uh, kingdoms in, in the area like this a 17th century record of a, a, a kingdom in Kalimantan where towns uh, were populated by traders and merchants from everywhere, uh, as in this example, Chinese and Malay, also Johor, Aceh, Malacca, uh, various indigenous peoples of the uh, Nusantara islands, but including Walanda is a European or a Dutch, people from Macau and Kalinga are people from India. Um, and, and, and this idea carried on well into the 19th century with this account by Isabella Bird. I love this sort of very romantic Victorian kind of description of, of uh, the exotic East, but I think it gives a nice visual sense of what Singapore must have been like with people from everywhere uh, in terms of the fashions that they wore. Robes of silk, uh, Parsis and spotless white, Jews and Arabs and dark rich silks. Kalings or uh, South Indians, Southern Indians in Turkey, red and white, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, this sort of lovely uh, kind of a very uh, romantic vision of, of, of all these exotic textiles and people in wonderful costumes all together sort of persevered well into uh, the 19th century. Um, plural pot city style. Um, when we look at texts like this, the Hikayat Raja Pasai of describing a 14th century nobleman uh, in the diverse fashions he might have dressed in. Um, so it, it, it was basically trying to express how elegant this and handsome this nobleman was, but it, it kind of reveals how people could cross dress culturally without any problem in those days. And, and this was because of the access to the amount of luxury goods and textiles and fashions from all over. So, you know, if you were to dress in Javanese style, you, you would be exactly like a Javanese. If you were to dress in Siamese style, et cetera, et cetera. So this kind of reveals that um, in, the, in the kingdom of Pasai, uh, Javanese fashions, Siamese fashions, Tamil style was all, Arab style uh, was all available. Um, interestingly, when we look at the dress codes of uh, 
uh, of Malacca by Iskandar Shah, one of the uh, early sultans, in this, which we find in the Sajara Malayu or the Malay Annals. Um, it reveals that the wearing of Tamil fashions was strictly reserved for the king, except for whoever it was the original clothing of, who were allowed to wear it for prayers and weddings. So um, Tamil fashions in this sort of 14th, 15th, 16th century period was considered sort of uh, very exclusive and um, the Sultan only wanted to reserve it for himself. Um, the interesting thing about how uh, people just did not conform to dress codes is found in this another uh, account in the Hikayat Banja, Banja is also in Kalimantan, um, where, where, a rest where kind of a, a warning was put in because they basically had to, you know, it was a kind of Asian way of, uh, Southeast Asian way of setting a law, you add a curse to it, or you, you know, you, something terrible would happen to you if you break the law. So uh, similarly, if you dress in the clothing of other uh, nationalities, you know, it would be very bad for the nation. And there was even a fashion police in, in this kingdom. Um, but what was more revealing was that it said that you needed the police because the common people dress according to their own desires. Um, I think this is also a very significant point when we think of the past, because often we might look at fashion history purely through the lens of the rules or dress codes when we should actually be looking at the reverse. How did people not conform? And, um, you know, it's like saying nobody smokes and takes drugs and nobody vapes in Singapore, you know, because it's illegal. Uh, we know all these things to be untrue. So um, there's a lot of history underneath uh, these rules and regulations. Uh, here is a wonderful illustration of Sultan Saifuddin of Tidor in East from uh, an island in the Maluku uh, in Eastern Indonesia. And uh, I think you can really see the sort of wonderful mix and match scenario here. So uh, the Sultan is wearing a chintz, probably a chintz jacket with this incredible gold chain. Uh, they were called Manila chains came out of Manila in filigree and uh, found their way in trade on, on ships, on sunken ships, we found them. Uh, and, and examples even in uh, Makassar, in, in the museums there. And, and look at how he's got a headband on and gold bangles, which he's tied on his headband. So uh, this is really his own style. Uh, fast forward to the 18th century, and I love this illustration of the son of the artist, Jan Brandes, a missionary who was in Batavia, Jakarta in the 18th century. So uh, this Dutch boy is dressed in a, probably a white cotton coat, but underneath that, he's got this white um, apron or bib, which we call an auto. It, it's, it's an old Hokkien word for a bib. Uh, and it started as, it was brought in from China, but in the end, in the 18th century, every child, from whatever nationality, uh, resident in Batavia and in the whole of the Nusantara was wearing these, uh, were, uh, was wearing these uh, bibs. Here is a Pranakan example from the early 20th century. The child would wear this without any pants or underpants and I think it was just to facilitate the uh, passing motion. Um, come to the 19th century, we had lots of trading companies in Singapore. Many of them were British, uh, Scottish, and English. Um, and in order to appeal to this sort of market of a multicultural market, you see uh, many scripts on these textile labels. Um, and also, uh, interestingly, when you com compare the, the branding for, for these labels for the Indian market, and Chinese market, they would rely on traditional symbols, uh, images of deities or Chinese narrative scenes. But for Southeast Asia, because you know you had to appeal to people from so many backgrounds, you would pick something like very easy to understand, like umbrella brand or cabbage brand. Um, and and this is quite an interesting way textiles and garments were marketed in the region. Um, here we see. Uh, uh, itinerant street peddler with his uh, mattresses, all from imported printed, possibly Manchester cottons, quilted Manchester cottons for sale. Um, and you can see that 
um, goods that come in were traded by people of all backgrounds. You know, it, it wasn't a situation where something Chinese was only sold by Chinese uh, peddler, etc. So uh, this was the nature of a port city. Uh, here is this wonderful photo of uh, on High Street with the tailor shops. So the uh, a lot of Cantonese from uh, Guangzhou and uh, Hong Kong uh, moving to Singapore, they seem to have brought uh, in certain skills, painting, photography, and tailoring. Um, so you start to see these European style tailors, Western style tailors um, opening up in Singapore in the 19th century, uh, catering to all kinds of people. So you can see a gentleman in front wearing a straw boater, Western style with in his fancy flares and a white drill cotton suit, Western style, probably made in one of these tailor shops. Um, here is a picture also of another tailor shop and you can see the, 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 the old origin of these multilingual signs. So Tong Chiong Tailor at the top, uh, si signage in Chinese, in Jawi Malay and in English. Uh, note in the front, uh, the assortment of people now moving on to a slightly different topic, but uh, this, Czech cloth or Madras cotton uh, cloth was really popular. So here is a Malay couple. Uh, the gentleman is wearing a drill cotton suit with a uh, kind samping or sarong in Czech sarong, probably made in India. The lady is wearing a Malay style baju, uh, but made of European printed cotton, but and also with this uh, Madras cotton sarong. Hi, Peter. Uh, Sorry to interrupt. Just two minutes to go. Thank you. Um, so then we start seeing these uh, hybrid fashions with Indian sarongs as well, Western jackets, very favored by Muslim gentlemen, uh, Indian Muslim gentlemen, and then st everyone started wearing them with fez caps, etc. cetera. Um, here we see a group of uh, Malay kind of uh, a Malay nobleman and, and his entourage, but uh, behind we see gentlemen, a gentleman wearing a Chinese style jacket with the European printed cottons, uh, assortment of uh, fashion styles from Malay and European to Chinese. Uh, and the same thing here, the Sultan of Sulu uh, with these uh, kind of bother boy uh, guards, I think that's super trendy. Uh, and um, these Ottoman inspired jackets. So very, very mixed kind of style. And similarly, a Pranakan gentleman here with a Western style suit, Chinese style buttons, Western style uh, trousers and a bowler hat. Uh, a Pranakan family like this, there was no dress code. Everybody's wearing a different style. The three ladies are in totally different styles and so are the gentlemen. Just draw your attention to the footwear. He's wearing these uh, uh, pumps, patent leather pumps, uh, which were imported in this case by a Chinese import-export company. Um, and everybody wore them. They were actually made for ballroom dancing in black tie events in Europe. And when they were sold in Singapore, people used them in completely different contexts. Uh, uh, and, and they were worn by members of um, different communities. Similarly here, we see uh, a lady in Western style brows with her sari showing these kind of random um, combinations. Then we come to the what that gentleman was wearing, these drill cotton suits, which call which I believe were originated in Singapore called the Singapore model suits sold in, the, in this uh, Dutch uh, department store catalog. Um, and we see Sun Yat Sen in Singapore in 1906 wearing a similar suit, but notice there's no dress code. All the Chinese gentlemen in this photograph are dressed in, in varying attire, uh, varying styles. So there was no set style, which is Singapore Southeast Asian style. Similarly, we see uh, a Japanese lady in Singapore wearing her kimono with uh, nonia slippers and uh, little brooches like kurosang. A Malay lady wearing a chantilly veil, uh, French veil, lace veil. Um, lastly, this fun picture of a snake charmer, but look behind at all the um, spectators, everybody is wearing a different hat. Um, and whatever you could afford, you just went to the shop and bought it. Nobody could tell you whether you could or could not wear it. Um, towards the end of the century, of course, all this became frowned upon and dressing became far more fixed. Um, and, and any kind of hybrid dressing and hybrid identities were criticized and uh, frowned upon. 
Um, lastly, just end this point about these various issues on self-fashioning that have emerged, but they tend to uh, come together as, as something very kind of uh, self-conscious, but um, I'd like to propose another kind of self-fashioning as you've seen where people were without rules. It was, it was not about resistance. It was not about um, a society, a community expressing any identity. It's just dressing as an, you know, in, in a com completely uh, sort of a random self-determining way without wanting to be part of anything. And groups were not so wanting to all wear uniforms. Um, yeah, so th this is sort of the last thought I, I'd like to um, to um, propose and for everyone to take away. Um, so the rest of Singapore, I would like to think of it as irrepressibly inconsistent, chaotically endemic, often impro improvised and unselfconsciously egalitarian fashion that was going on here. Uh, the last picture I'd like to show is an all-family photo uh, of three grand uncles. One is dressed in a drill cotton suit, the other one is in a t-shirt, one is eating with a spoon, the other with his hands. Um, it shows you how often when we look at an old photograph, we, we assert or impose the kind of ethnicity on them. And when people left to their own, this isn't a picture of people wanting to be Pranakan or Chinese or anything. They, they're just their inconsistent, random selves doing things just the way they like to. And um, I would say Singapore was one of the places and the early port cities where we were so global and so ahead that we were doing all this way before anyone else. Thank you. So I will now introduce Kiko. Uh, so Kiko Del Rosario is a master student of art history at the Universidad uh, Nacional Autónoma de Mexico. From 2016 to 2021, he was researcher and archivist at the Cultural Center of the Philippines. In 2021, he was shortlisted for the Ateneo Art Awards. From 2021 to 2022, he was a fellow at the Art Schools of Asia, convened by the 12th, the Art Asia Art Archive and Getty Foundation. His work, conflating uh, the modernities of the KISS and the graphic arts, was published in Impact Printmaking Journal, while his monographic study of the artist Little Mayo will be published in the forthcoming issue of Southeast Asia of Now. And with that, um, I'd like to pass on the time to Kiko. Thank you, Wiki. Wichi, for the introduction, and um, good morning, everyone. My thanks also go to uh, Kurtold and especially to doctors um, Rebecca Arnold, Nadia Wang, and um, Acacia for organizing today's symposium. I'm very pleased to be here alongside my, uh, my co-panelists and to be part of this conference, hosting an, an incredible roster of thinkers and artists working on um, Southeast Asian fashion. So today I will be presenting um, Dressing Down Up, I'm sorry, Dressing Up Down in All Directions, which is um, an ongoing reflection on the ways by which we might conceive of the dress um, eccentrically. So let me begin with an anecdote of an encounter I had with a saint um, from just a few years back. In the short while when parts of Joseph's gown were being removed, I found myself contemplating the notions of dress and undress. Starting from the top and only from memory, the saint's longtime custodian, Reynaldo, took out one by one bits and sheets of brass and silver, and bolted the screws and pegs which joined together the metal pieces, as if to unlock the anatomy of the dress that poses riddlingly. The groping and tugging, unlatching and unclicking that are necessary for disrobing Joseph moved at a pace that betrayed the dramaturgy of its, of its contours. I soon recon that this form of dressmaking is also so strikingly different. And as I caught closer sight of the unique configuration of the saint's garb, whose curvatures and folds, just as its cuts and perforations sneak through toggle with, and wrap around the wooden sculpture, it seemed to me this dress now being removed like layers of overgrowth text or barnacles of time, to quote the art historian Michael Ann Hawley, being pulled out of a mass from different directions, anatomized only to reveal the irony that lies inside. 
Underneath the metal regalia, what I've discovered was, in fact, another dress, ensemble, this time directly painted on the hardwood. By plucking out or peeling out history this way, what I had discovered, it seemed, was more history. More mortal meanders and carnal curves. And then it occurred to me, disrobing Joseph would be akin to writing art history. That the work of the Holy Saints dress and undress draws close to the art historical custom to lay bare its subject, which it would subsequently need to swathe in language or clothe in words. In fact, in Middle English, to dress is to put straight, while in Old German, to queer is to make oblique. The paradox here presented renders faulty the notion of queering the dress or dressing the queer, as if to deny any hope of slanting the linear garment and its history. How can something simultaneously be straightened and made as Q? On the one hand, the English language conveys the verticality of dress, employing phraseology such as dress up, dress up, or dress down, to index the degree of formality in which a person is expected to clothe oneself, a custom which upheld the social order that emerged in the Philippines under Spanish colonial rule. The pan-Philippine word for dress, kasuotan, on the other hand, has for its root word suot or sulot, which means to enter. This lexical fabric jumpstarts the ways through which we might consider the pieces of clothing that we see, if not wear. Aside from regarding the dress as a linear conception which submits to gravity, you might also think of it concentrically, which means with center, or better yet, in the spirit of this conference, eccentrically or off-center. I suggest, I suggest that eccentricity is not merely an evocation. Rather, it is a line of thought that materializes the unconventional dress. This queer dress is fashioned by the eccentric actant who puzzles over the strange and sensuous body as a transient and contemplated sight which the dress alternatingly comes into and comes out of. So like the idea of the dress as like, a place or like even a form of architecture, right? So by this premise, the body occupied is constantly in a state of dressing and undressing, of straightening and unstraightening. The Philippine lexicon yields to the words forma, itchura, and postura, um, their meanings I've put here. When considered alongside the Spanish forma, etchura and postura from which they were conjured. A modernity of appearing emerges as the dress had traversed Iberia and America towards the Philippines. The idea of dressing as straightening is also conjured in the Spanish word for dress or traje, which also means to make uniform, and which we find in the title of the 1847 album, Vistas de las Islas Filipinas y Trajes de sus Habitantes, or Views of the, Views of the Philippine Islands and Dresses of its Inhabitants. The album, illustrated by the Manileño watercolorist Jose Honorato Luzano, evinces the intrinsic connection of dress with, the sex, with sex and body. The album's author, the Spanish editor Gervasio Gironelia, for example, writes about the native. So I'm, I'm giving a translation of what's written here. The natural position for the natives is to be seated in a squatting position. This is how they rest and they remain in this position for hours at a time. Although it should be noted that they seem to prefer to do so. Uh, sorry, noted that they seem to prefer to do so if they are able to on a railing, on the edge of a sidewalk or someplace where there is little support. There are some natives who carry on as if they were dead after sitting inside the cockpit, where they spend four or five hours in a position that would not hold a European for 20 minutes. When they sit in another way, they take all kinds of positions, but do not find themselves at ease. So here you would see um, this position that Hir Hironelia is talking about. This account of etchura and postura holds the description of everyday activity by which native is seen to be different. 
Here too, Porma becomes the precept by which the gender question arises. He, uh, he continues. The kerchief is an indispensable thing for the natives and serves them for everything besides the object for which it was invented. For they hold it with their fingers. Uh, for they hold it with their fingers. And when they do not wear it around their hands, they wear it in every way imaginable. And it would be easy to make a very extensive selection just by varying the posture of the kerchief, both in men and women. Women, however, generally wear it only on their heads when they go to church, um, as you can see in this illustration. Well, the men wear it very often as if they were women, he writes, in the form of a cloak when they are cold and over the part of the body they wish to keep warm. The mother, so here you would also see how natives have elected to use the kerchief, which Hiranelia describes or thinks to be strange. The modernities of philology and of the dress thus point to the natives hermeneutics of formal European clothing that do not necessarily agree with the uses from which it had arrived and which is to Hironelia strange. His account also underlines the gender binary that is Joseph's, that Joseph's ensemble surmounts. So Joseph dons a long wig, undergoes regular touch-ups, and arrayed in a metal gown that follows the design of the traje de vestisa. The everyday female gown worn in the 19th century Filipina, Filip, Philippines by the mestizo class, or the mixed race class, it consists of four parts that we also see in Joseph. The camisa, or the colorless long sleeve blouse, the panuelo, or the kerchief worn over the shoulders, the tapis, or apron-like overskirt worn around the waist, and the saya, or the long skirt shaped like a cylinder or cupola. The resident maker's outlandish transliteration of Joseph's gown emerges out of its material data, which is id idiosyncratic for its engraved and punched silver, affixed to wrought brass sheets manufactured in Birmingham, England, under the company P. H. Munt's 1872 patent. I was struck especially knowing that the sculpture acts as an index to the founding of the parish town of San Jose de Navotas, the municipality directly north of the Philippine capital Manila in the mid-19th century, around the same time in which the album, the album of illustrations that I've just showed you, um, was made. So it is also a family heirloom that registers the socioeconomic um, dominance of its patrons in the capital adjacent region during the Spanish colonial period which saw high trade activity between the Philippines and Europe. It was under these conditions when Joseph's dressmaker uh, forged, plied, and cut the brass that we see in Joseph. I find the queer mind taking shape in these pieces that are far different from the dresses of other Philippine patron saints, which are usually single-piece triangular garments embroidered or decorated with ornaments and worn over the saint. I find this kind of slant intellect to be present also in the work of Carl Jan Cruz, who, while educated at Central St. Martin's in London, draw, draws upon the familiar and evo evocative feeling of mad Manila life in the making of his fashion presentations. Cruz describes the methodology of his practice to be some aesthetics, a field of inquiry that puts bodily perception, performance, and presentation into service, um, and whose approach aims to translate archival and reference wardrobe staples into technically and emotionally charged pieces. The outcome of this um, thinking and procedure appears in tropes that treat cogent um, measured measured asymmetry, indiscriminate patchwork that veneers the body diaphanously, um, if not grows like moss to which body clings to, so as to marry wearer and worn into a single mass. Folds, flaps, and cuts that expose thoughtfully the complexion, the pinching or tightening of the garment so as to protest against gravity's dull drape, 
carefree lines that hurtle across the fabric, and who seems like proud scars congregate at times boldly and merrily in one area. And cuffs and hems that are incapable of being straight and therefore tilt at an angle. Cruz thinks of his work as concepts that refine sentiment into something tangible. Apart from his denim line, he regularly sells a pambahay line, which is, pambahay is like clothes worn inside the house, um, which he describes as an aparador or closet collection that can also be used as um, panglakwacha or panglabas, which are clothes you wear outside, uh, outside of home. Yeah. So I find this attempt to blur the inside and outside to be recipient of the dress and its theorization. When Cruz proposes that housewear and um, outside wear to be single, he challenges the hierarchy of dressing up and down. The formal conventions of dress inherited from colonial catechisms of the body, which to, um, to my pleasure is uh, constantly being questioned by uh, the contemporary fashion world. And um, at this point, I find Whitney Davis's uh, the art historian Whitney Davis's ideas of dislocation and transposition in queer beauty as gestures that are not only possible in art. They are essential to art. The surface form of the artwork dislocates and transposes images in the depths of the art of the artist's mind. Despite the formal perfection of an artwork and our resulting sense that everything is placed in the work just where it should be, there is an equally important way in which we sense that things could be placed differently. And I close quote. Hence, the dress that arrives to us today is never arbitrary. Davis here asks us to think of the dress as the material data, school, and thinking born under certain circumstances that had prevailed over others. As an art historian, I find striking the ways in which people elect to cover their bodies. Indeed, it is a conscious choice. Walking around the streets of Manila or Mexico, for example, I notice how people, myself included, more often than not dress homogeneously or uniform. There are rare, rare occasions, however, when I come across someone dressed differently like a needle in a haystack, and I wonder about how, how much undress they had undergone in order to dress neither up nor down, but in divergent directions. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I hope you are enjoying the front and off center Fashion in Southeast Asia conference so far. I gave a welcome presentation and we had the first two sessions, fashion curation and fashion time travels. If you are joining us for the first time from this session, welcome. A note that we are recording the conference and plan to upload it so you can catch up on sessions that you are not able to attend live. We are now going to session three featuring fashion brands and it is my pleasure to pass the mic to my friend and colleague, Rohai Zatul Azar. Rohai, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Nadia. Hello, everyone, and welcome back once again. Um, as what Dr. Nadia was saying just now, for those of you who have just joined us, welcome and thank you for joining us um, for Front and Off Center, Fashion and Southeast Asia at the Kotal Research Forum. Um, first of all, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Rohai Zatul Azhar. I am a fashion lecturer um, at LaSalle College of the Arts, Singapore, as well as an independent fashion journalist. Um, this evening, I will be the chairperson for session three on fashion brands. Um, the presenters, both Toton Januar and Tao Vu, um, will each give about 15 minutes presentation. As with previous sessions, um, we will then have a joint Q&A segment where you can type in questions for the speakers. All right. Um, so I would like to introduce our first speaker, Toton. Uh, Toton Janwa developed a fascination with the artisanal aspect of design at a very young age. Um, born in Makassar, he later relocated um, to Jakarta and obtained a degree in media broadcasting while working as a designer for one of Indonesia's most prominent um, fashion designers. Uh, later, he further sought to broaden his design vocabulary by taking a course of, um, on fashion study at Parsons New School of Design in New York. 
he started to turn to provide an answer to the modern woman's needs of individual style. Um, he will be presenting on Kabaya, the intersection of past and um, future. Toton, over to you. Okay. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much uh, for having me. Thank you, Rohai, for the introduction. And it is our, it is my pleasure uh, to be here to talk to you about uh, what we do at Toton. So uh, my name is Toton Januar. I am the co-founder and creative director of the brand Toton. And Toton is a women's wear label based in Jakarta, Indonesia. Let me share my screen. So um, through Toton, we are trying to retell Indonesia's inherent stories through fresh eyes and new vision. Toton is a contemporary women's wear brand that explores the nation's natural beauty and diverse culture with modern reinterpretation, celebrating heritage while deconstructing traditions for a new approach to women's ready to wear fashion. That's what we aim to do in uh, at Toton. And um, it was founded in 2012 with my partner, Haryu Balitar, out of our mutual interest in exploring Indonesia's uh, true fashion. So uh, Kebaya, Kebaya has been, Kebaya has been part of Toton Design vocabulary as inspiration for several collection throughout the label journey so far. Our filtration, our flirtation with the idea of Kebaya become a serious affair as we're taking the next step in preparing our next collection that will be centered on the idea of Kebaya, what it means for Indonesian like me and how far we can expand the idea of Kebaya. So uh, this is basically uh, our mood board for our next collection that will be centered on the idea of Kebaya. But looking back, we have uh, some pieces that inspired by Kebaya throughout our collections uh, so far. And uh, with this in mind, we're trying to dig more uh, in order to be able to to explore and to expand our idea of kebaya and how uh, it could fit into contemporary fashion. So to have a complete understanding of kebaya, not only the technicality of how it's built, but also as an article of traditional clothing and what it represents. That's what uh, we're trying to seek in this, uh, in this research. And to be able to do that, we are doing our research, compiling information from various sources and talking with several people who are knowledgeable of the matter. So we are trying back, trying to trace back the origin of Kebaya in particularly in Indonesia. So Kebaya is the most recognizable piece of clothing from Southeast Asia. Indonesia in particular, yet the history of and the definition of kebaya itself are st still subject uh, for discussions. According to sources that we gathered, by definition, kebaya is an upper body garment that has an open front feature and is traditionally made of lightweight fabrics such as brocade, cotton, lace or voile, and is sometimes decorated with embroidery. The front is secured with buttons, pins, or brooches. Whereas the lower garment for this garment is usually known as a sarong or long piece of cloth wrapped around the waist and can be, bat can be batik, songket, or traditional woven fabric. So as we can see, uh, in the picture, we have various traditional kebaya styles in Indonesia. So kebaya is officially recognized as the national garment and also the icon of Indonesian fashion. Although the use of kebaya mostly 
by Javanese, Sundanese, and Balinese, kebaya can also be found on, in other cultures in Indonesia. As we can see, we have uh, in the picture kebaya from uh, Ambon, from Minahasa, and uh, also from Sulawesi, and they also uh, can be, uh, can be uh, known as baju bodo in Sulawesi, but it's a form of kebaya in my opinion and in our research. There are few theories how the kebaya originated and how the clothing came, came to be. So tracing the history of the emergence of kebaya in Indonesia, we cannot escape the influence of foreign nations that come into Indonesia. From various collected sources, there are several theories about the history of the emergence of kebaya as a body cover, especially for women in Indonesia. The notion that kebaya was born on the grounds of politeness has a lot to do with the assimilation of foreign cultures as well as religions and beliefs into Indonesia. One theory that kebaya was adopted with the introduction of Islam in the Southeast Asia region in the 15th century and the term kebaya is believed to have originated from the, the word, the Arabic word kaba, meaning clothing. This term may be related to the Arabic word abaya, which means loose cloak or garment. The term was later introduced to, Nus to Indonesia, to Nusantara, through an acquired word from the Portuguese language abaya. This is also in line with the spread of kebaya across the archipelago of Indonesia. Almost every region in Indonesia has some kind of kebaya or kebaya-like top, such as kebaya Minahasa, as you, you see uh, in this previous uh, slide. This is kebaya Minahasa, kebaya Ambon, or even baju bodo from Sulawesi. Kebaya has, has experienced so much development in terms of shape, fabric, style throughout the time from a simple long sleeve blouse shape with an opening on the front combined with pin buttons or brooch to a variety to, of diverse translations of the construction shape, shape and how the kebaya fits and attach to the body. The simple shape of kebaya is like a canvas that is ready to absorb various colors and forms from the acculturation attached to it. So, uh, when the Dutch colonized Indonesia in the 19th century, the influence of European culture also merged into, into kebaya, resulting in a lace kebaya, which was generally white with lace edges with uh, European uh, kind of lace, as we can see in the picture. Also the use of heavier fabric as velvet and gold bullion embroidery on Japanese kebaya is adopted from European crafts. Also, the influence of Chinese culture that come through the trade gave birth to kebaya enchim or kebaya nyonya, where the shape and the pointed front end was elong that elongated and the embroidery of various colors became its signatures. In Java itself, kebaya was originally used only by aristocrat women in the palace as a symbol of decency and honor. However, kebaya was finally used by female servants at the palace with a form with the shape and form that informed by the clothes of the Dutch army troops, and it's called kebaya jangan. There are so many variations and translations in this, of this form of kebaya that can be found in regions in Indonesia and also neighboring countries, of course, such as Malaysia, Singapore, Brunei, Thailand, and the Philippines. On the other hand, kebaya is signified as a very flexible and democratic medium, in my opinion. But on the other hand, it becomes a cultural identity of each ethnic group that is very strongly linked with their culture. So for Indonesia themselves, kebaya has become an identity and kebaya has become part of history of Indonesia, from the wives of um, 
Pangeran Diponegoro, the Prince of Diponegoro, uh, that um, fight against invaders and triggered the birth of Kebaya Jangan that was inspired by uh, the army uh, troops uniform. And also Raden Ajeng Kartini, an emancipation hero for, from Indonesia, for Indonesian women, women whose way of dressing sparked the term Kebaya Kartini to the establishment of Kebaya as Indonesia's national clothing by President Sukarno after Indonesian independence. Kebaya has become part of the identity of the Indonesian, Indonesian nation, especially Indonesian women. As a designer, as a designer and as a brand, exploring the idea and identity of Kebaya with the aim of expansion, modernization, or even subversion becomes an exciting yet precarious journey for us. The term and the idea of Kebaya have been loosely adapted and translated over the years. Sometimes they've got lost in the process. So in my opinion, if we are to use the term Kebaya properly, the design itself should resemble and or qualify as Kebaya by definition. In my experience, sometimes it is so hard to determine what's qualified as Kebaya or not. And we just have to go with our intu intuition, which is quite difficult in, in, this, in this matter. But if it doesn't re resemble Kebaya at all, and I have to say that there's a lot of people now claim Kebaya or, or it, is, it is a proper Kebaya, but it is in fact, it's not Kebaya. So it shouldn't be called Kebaya. I personally would like to use the term Kebaya inspired for contemporary pieces that are not qualified as proper Kebaya. So these are some uh, contemporary, contemporary interpreta interpretation of Kebaya by Indonesian designers. And actually, the research that we conduct actually resulted in more questions than answers, if I can be honest. So here are some of the questions. What really defined Kebaya? Because we, we really have to know what we want to be inspired uh, by, and we have to know what we, we're going to deconstruct, if we want to deconstruct, or if we want to explore or expand, we really have to know the definition of the, the garment. What is Kabaya and what it represents? How, how technically it's done? So if we want to put a twist on it or, or if we want to uh, put a contemporary spin on it, we know what we're doing. Also, how far can we take the inspiration with Kebaya and how far the designs can go and to be able to still be linked with the source of inspiration. I think this is very important. I mean, of course, with us uh, who lives, who, 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 who have Kebaya as part of our, our culture here in Southeast Asia, Kebaya has become something of a norm, something that we own and, and we can we actually like have the rights to to be inspired and to explore that but i think it's still a gray area where we appropriate it or put a, a spin that uh that that's that's not respectful to the culture so i think i think that's one thing that we should always put in mind, which bring me to the next question, how far can we expand the context of Kebaya? And as we, we've learned so far, the flexible and democratic nature of Kebaya has allowed it to absorb so many cultures and transforms the Kebaya into many different shape and form and to serve different cultural contexts. But how far can it go? I mean, some of my customers and my friends uh, who are Gen Z, uh, they ask if, 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 if guys can also wear kebaya or can you design kebaya for guys? I, th I think that's one of the example, like 
would it be blasphemous if the context of kabaya is taken crossing crossing gen genders for example so that's all i have for today and i think it's open for discussion now uh the idea and the 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 concept that i just present and thank you so much for listening to me and back to you rohai thank you toton that was very very insightful and very very good questions that you have um posed at the end right um okay so um i would like to now um introduce our next speaker um Tao, all right, um, and um, uh, Tao Wu is the founder and creative director of Kilomet 109, an eco fashion brand from Hanoi, Vietnam. Um, a fashion designer by training, Tao is also a practicing textile artist, um, an experienced natural dyer. She is also a pioneer of the contemporary slow fashion movement in Vietnam. Uh, her textile practice is a collaborative endeavor with several Vietnamese artisan communities, each representing a different ethnic group with distinctive craft traditions. Um, hello, Tao. You can take hello, it away. Hello, oh, hi. Hello, oh, hi. Thank you for hello. the introduction. Uh, and hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, so, uh, you know, oh, hi, give you some um, some brief introduction about uh, what I'm doing uh, in Hanoi with Kilomet 109. Um, so I'm going to go straight to my presentation. Uh, so uh, the idea that I start with Kilomet 109 um, is the desire to to create uh, fashion forward pieces, uh, which which uh, from the ground up, home grow uh, fibers, um, uh, natural dyes, uh, hand woven, handcrafted by working directly with the local artisans on every element that go into them. Uh, and right now we're working with seven um, communities around Vietnam, two Noon groups, uh, two Herman groups, uh, two scene maker communities. And lately we expand our network with the Lao textile community in Viet Bien Phu province uh, in Northern Highland of Vietnam. Uh, our products uh, are intimately connect with the place, uh, the provenance uh, and the people behind them. Uh, we always um, put community first uh, using com contemporary design in support uh, cultural uh, preservation, uh, environment protection and com community development. And um, our products, um, seen uh, our product is uh, practical, very practical, affordable, uh, and when made garments uh, made by human uh, artisan rather than mass produced by machine, uh, this has provide uh, valuable incomes for the makers, for the community, and uh, also help uh, incentivize uh, the pre preservation of uh, fading tradition in Vietnam. Uh, craftsmanship is lies at the heart of our designs, uh, and these attributes celebrate products, uh, but also showcase uh, exceptional artisanal skills and unique techniques um, that we um, we really want to um, focus uh, and to emphasize uh, in through our design. This is a few uh, collections uh, that we. Uh, produce um, and uh, uh, the last collection is named To. To in Vietnamese means soy, um, and uh, we want to honor the land that we depend upon to cultivate uh, our fibers, uh, botanical dyes, um, and even the minerals uh, we use to produce a wide range of earthy color in this collection, which you're going to see soon. <laughs> Uh, and this is a few uh, images that I um, I, I, uh, I did a, um, a workshop uh, to help uh, this community Laos in Viet Bien Phu to uh, maximize their uh, local uh, resources uh, and also to improve uh, certain techniques that they uh, they want to explore further. 
uh, especially in natural dyeing, uh, to allow weavers the excellent uh, in terms of create patterns, very intricate, beautiful cottons uh, and silk, um, but the natural dyeing not really um, advanced yet. So I did the uh, workshop with them and right after the workshop finished, after 10 days, um, we decide to work together. So the whole collection is a one who really feature this community strongly uh, through the fibers that we use, uh, like a brown cotton on the side, and also banana silks that we work and uh, develop with the other communities. Uh, we try to explore, continue to explore uh, the ability that um, the local um, local plant diversity. Uh, and with these collections, we uh, not only apply uh, which already exists, um, like the weaving methods, uh, and also the Lao uh, artisans, they have incredible loom uh, that can allow us to weave a much bigger weed and also more uh, ornate, more uh, intricate patterns. Uh, and um, with this collection, we, uh, we, we also ex experiment um, new methods and new dyes, uh, also new way of weaving pattern as well. And for us, um, uh, you know, to, uh, for us is the entire production chains, um, it's maintained locally um, because we want to ensure uh, a truly uh, transparent and ecologically sustainable model, uh, which is um, in Vietnam, it's not many at the moment. Uh, we have a few designers, young designers, uh, also apply traditional uh, textile and, and cloth, uh, but to be able to follow the whole loop of production, uh, it's, it's not many. Uh, we're pretty much um, alone at the moment, uh, <clears throat> which is great because uh, we have a whole freedom of uh, of, of uh, explore uh, and at the same time to, uh, to be able to uh, set um, the, the way that um, can engage uh, the young designers to uh, not afraid <laughs> to walk to this direction uh, and to walk, uh, to work, to create the fashion is from really from seed uh, to the final products. Um, we always explore the tension between uh, experimentation and uh, rosemary, uh, rose mas masary, sorry. Um, and uh, Kilometer 109 use innovation to push the boundary of tradition craft practice. Uh, some of this textile experiment um, that you see um, featured in this collection is it's a striking orange. Uh, and this one is from rock dye. Uh, oh, hi, I think I shared with you uh, before on one of the long interview that you did with me about this rock dye. Um, and also it feature um, others, um, botanical dyes from leaves, uh, from box. Um, uh, but, and, and uh, here's some designs that, uh, that you see that we're using uh, rock dye um, and, and dye with cotton and silk. Uh, and variety of silk. Uh, master craftsmanship is applied at every stage of the garment production uh, that we, um, we do uh, from the textile themselves uh, to the very uh, meticulously um, crafted details. Um, we really want to create uh, a harmonious uh, plan of tradition craft and contemporary design. Uh, I only try to design garment that um, wearable and uh, innovative uh, at the same time. Uh, and each piece is carry its own story. Um, and um, I believe that a good and socially engaged um, design can really have foster the sense of community uh, and cultivate the conditions of positive uh, well-being. Um, thank you for listening. Uh, I think we can, um, I can answer uh, further questions uh, if you have for me for the next section. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thao. Um, I will pass um, 
uh, baton over to my colleague, um, Daniela Monastero-San, who, who will be chairing the next session um, on hybridity in fashion. Yes, hybridity in fashion. Daniela? Thank you, Rohai. Oh my gosh, what a great panel. I'm so inspired and like heartwarming feelings. <laughs> um, so uh, we will start the next session shortly. Um, hi, everyone, if you're just joining us now. Uh, thank you for joining us for Front and Off Center Fashion in Southeast Asia at the Courtauld Research Forum. Um, my name is Daniela Monasterio Stan, and I am a fashion lecturer and researcher based in Singapore. I will be the chairperson for the fourth and last session for today on hybridity in fashion. Unfortunately, Sang Tai will not be able to join us in this session. Um, Dr. Chom Wan will give a 15 to 20 minute presentation. We will then have a Q&A segment where you can type in questions for her. And I will now like to introduce Dr. Chomwan Wira Warawit. Dr. Chomwan has collaborated with artists for over 15 years in a range of different capacities, from curating to producing to directing. She holds a PhD from King's College London in intellectual property, with a focus on how intellectual property can be used as a tool in the textiles and fashion industries in developing countries. In 2010, she founded Mysterious Ordinary, a creative studio that curates, creates, and produces projects with artists, filmmakers, architects, and designers. In 2016, she co-founded Philip Huang, a fashion brand and vehicle that collaborates with artisans in Northeast Thailand, effectively creating a working case study and proof of concept for her thesis. In 2022, she co-curated the third edition of the Bangkok Art Biennale. Dr. Chongwan, take it away. Okay. Thank you so much, Daniela, for the introduction. Thank you for having me on this um this conference. You know, it's um not always so easy to be the last presenter when everyone before you has, you know, how do you say there's such passion and commitment to what it is that we're talking about, which ultimately is this region, it's Southeast Asia. And if you um, will allow me, I'm going to share my screen and we're, and I'll be presenting you know, the topic here. Share. And then here we go. So as Daniela can, can introduce, you know, introduced me, I think this, this idea of hybridity, so we're talking about hybridity and, you know, I feel like the last 15 years, I've, um, how do you say, gone from one thing to the other. There's always been a through line. And I think with age, you sort of realize what the through, the through line could be. I think for a long time, I couldn't really figure it out. And I think this idea of hybridity, you know, the brilliant title that Dr. Nadia gave to the session, and I'm really sad that Sang can't make it because I think it would have been a really nice sort of balancing act that we could have had. Um, but you know, the, an artisanal future, it's kind of really how my thesis has evolved, but indigo is the practice, it's the subject matter, and it's what my husband and I do with Philip Huang. So without further ado, I'm going to share with you a little bit from our world. It's um, a trailer from a film that we made a few years ago, documenting our journey to Sikona Khan. <laughs> So you see, finding Oasis, it's a journey back to the land. And this idea of hybridity, what I'm presenting today, and I think the idea that we're talking about, or you know, what I've heard throughout the day is, you know, what we are in Southeast Asia, the land, alternative practices, that there is an alternative, that there is a way to look at fashion that's not the lens which we in a way have adopted. And what does this look like? So for me, this idea of hybridity, it's a search for an alternative. It's a hybrid between existing norms and the ever evolving contemporary. It's not 
a protest. It's actually an understanding and it's understanding the present and, you know, the past such that we are able to deconstruct. And I put here, it's a subtle interrogation of the present because again, it's not necessarily a revolution. It's understanding that there can be coexistence. So then it's reimagining, reconfiguring, and combining combining ideas and knowledge, knowing and understanding that the ancient and the new can coexist. And how is this manifested in fashion, both in how it's made and what it is? So the you know, artisanal futures, it's actually been, I think in recent years, a big topic in contemporary art also, but also in development. Um, and there's many versions of it, and it connects also to climate futures. In fact, the first time I kind of gave this presentation, you know, we got to NTU and ASEAN, there was a conference called Climate Futures in December in Jakarta. And that was where for the first time it was like a light bulb went off. And I said, oh my gosh, there are so many of us, you know, we're sitting here, we've adopted a system or a version of development that sees us taking from the land where the artisan is rendered perhaps irrelevant and they don't have a say in this narrative, nor does the path of development embrace them. So what this version, what this future, in fact, all of these futures they look at is that the artisan forms a vision of the future. It's not just robots, it's not just factories, it's not just industries. And the artisanal future sees the artisan as not an exception, but actually part of the norm. And, you know, how this relates to the research. I mean, I did my PhD some time back. And back then, you know, this discussion of intellectual property and textiles, like what does it matter? I think we were very concerned still in a way when you look at IP, you look at trademarks, you look at copyrights, you look at branding. And, you know, for a while, I wanted to apply this to building brands in Southeast Asia. But then after a while, what I realized is in that big catalog of instruments, legal instruments that you could use, traditional knowledge and geographical indications were also part of that catalog and something that very much spoke, spoke to and still speaks to the land. It speaks to humans. And um, th what this map is for is, you know, my area of research, it was a comparative model where we looked at, you know, broadly speaking, the UK is the developed industrialized kind of model. I looked at China at the time, you know, this was inspired by the end of the multi-fiber agreement in 2005, which basically, you know, I think there was that phrase where the, the, the dragon wakes up and that was it, you know, there was no more quotas for China for production and production moved there. And then we look at Thailand, you know, so a direct result of the end of the multi-fiber agreement meant that many, many countries in Southeast Asia no longer held a comparative edge and that comparative edge was price. So why is it always a race to the bottom? Fashion, you know, since the dawn of the industrial Re revolution, the thing that sparked off the industrial revolution was the spinning jenny. It has always been a race to the bottom to safeguard margins. But what about, what about the artisan? What about the people? What about the human condition? What if, this model could be used to elevate the human condition with knowledge and resources that they already have. What if it is not preserved in museums, but it, you know, it's what the speakers before me said, you know, it's part, it becomes part of life or it come, becomes part of life again. And, you know, it just so, so has it that this path is also perhaps more in harmony with nature and has a lower impact on the climate. So what you're really looking at is an alternative, which is in a way for us in Southeast Asia, right in front of our eyes. Um, our area of research, my husband and I, in 2016, we went to Sakonakan in the Northeast of Thailand, which for a long time was seen as, you know, sort of rural and maybe less educated than the city. But, you know, Bangkok only accounts for 30% of the rest of the country. And what we forget is there's also an abundance of, of farmland, of nature, of know-how. So indigo was, you know, I think I speak to a room of, you know, people who understand and know what indigo and natural dyes and everything is. But, you know, for those that don't, indigo was first discovered over 6,000 years ago. And it's an ancient dye, but it's an ancient dye that goes through a double fermentation process, which is, which is by man. So how the ancients figured this out, I'm not sure, but it's pretty amazing that we've seen the journey of indigo throughout 
you know, the earth through the water. And the history of indigo in Thailand is, is very unique because it doesn't suffer from the stigma of, you know, the kind of slave trade and what happened in the colonies. It, it, it didn't, it was kind of in a way removed from the history of indigo in India or in Pakistan or in Bangladesh because we weren't effectively colonized during the colonial era. What happened after World War II or the Cold War and the unraveling of that and what version of development we're in is probably another topic. But for all intents and purposes, we were not colonized. So our indigo was left alone. Our craft was left alone. It wasn't really documented. It continued to be a way of life. You know, this is from our visual essay from the documentary. Uh, and, and, you know, this is how the plant becomes a paste and then eventually a dye. Um, and I thought, you know, it's funny when I was putting this together and we, we, we look at this global history of indigo and this ancient dye, you, for, you sometimes automatically hone in on what's happening in Japan or what's happening in India, but actually this is universal and this is a teeny, teeny sampling of the indigo that exists in the world. It's a universal language in a way. And the first picture is uh, some scraps. It was where, when they first identified um, that there was blue pigment in some fabrics, in some textiles that were, that were found in Peru. And this is where the 6,000 years kind of comes from. So you have, you know, Sumbani's ikat, you've got the way that indigo is dyed in India. Interestingly, indigo is, is dyed by ladies in Thailand. So the artisans, you know, they became kind of our indigo grandmas. They taught us, they've become like family, extended family. You've got the blue men of the Sahara, the Tuaregs were in West Africa here, and then you've got the Japanese kimono. So the second part of, not the second part, but what the artisanal futures idea leads into is this idea of indigo as livelihood. And what does livelihood mean? And how, you know, how does this hybridity model kind of inform it and how can it take shape? So if livelihood is simply a means of securing the necessities of life, right, clean air, you know, difficult these days, shelter, food, education, health, all of that, the necessities, that is a livelihood. What is indigo's livelihood? How can indigo or craft for that matter be used as a means to securing the necessities of life? And I think what is synonymous throughout our communities where they're still dying and they're still weaving is it's not just an action which is done, you know, it is a way of life. In Thailand, you know, you farm and you weave and you dye and you know the indigo crop is grown alongside on the off season from the rice crop and it's really a way of life and this knowledge does define entire communities and it's knowledge which is passed on through generations and i think this picture is really significant for us in our journey because you know the first lady in the all blue that's masaat from bandong sio village in Sakona Khan. And she was in a way the first grandma who adopted Philip and I, and she taught us how to die. She experimented with us. She goes through kind of, you know, whether we wanted, whether it's cashmere, whether it's like strange patterns, whether, you know, and she, she kind of went through, guided us. And, you know, they're very wise. This is the, the three ladies are examining a jumpsuit, which we made inspired by the Air Force jumpsuit. It's called the Bowman jumpsuit. And they looked at it with such wonder, you know, so Tao, if you're still here, it's it's amazing and fascinating to have that conversation as to how the fabrics that they do that are traditional can become something else. And interestingly in Thailand, if you watch our documentary, there is a passage where Masa'a talks about how 20 years ago, she couldn't couldn't have dreamt of wearing indigo into town because they would have just seen her as a country bumpkin. And, you know, that was something that wasn't to, something to aspire to. And now, you know, indigo is registered as a geographical indication and it's sought after and their skills are sought after. So, you know, this is another village that we work with, Don Gai. Don Gai is now an experimental model, which Vogue Thailand and one of our um, fashion designing princesses has used as you know, to basically see how this sustainable model of, you know, cooperative, uh, how do you say, like organization can help to, to really, it's no longer just a secondary income. You're really looking at real livelihood. 
Um, this is our friend, this is Philip, and then this is Man. So Man is a first generation dyer from Sakona Khan. Like me, he um, studied law, uh, but he felt that he wanted to go home and actually use his hands to make something and to make things. I think this idea of making things is really important. And man was who taught us to make our first bat. And he was very patient with us. In fact, he was just over talking to us about making watercolors from indigo paste. And he has a garden in Sikona Khan that looks at biodiversity. And, you know, he's a wonderful teacher and very young. So this is man and Philip talking about indigo. And so we get to this point of in what indigo. So we can replace indigo with other things. You know, we can be ecat weaving. It can be all sorts of things. So just this idea of indigo, how does it become livelihood and why does it matter? So indigo is craft, it is knowledge for me in order for it to keep alive. And if we're gonna work towards this future together, it has to be shared. So sharing ensures that it continues to live. It sounds like a simple ask, but you know, sometimes maybe at the end of your life, a master weaver could be like, well, I don't wanna share, what's, what's it for, you know? And I think, or the, that idea of like, I have something which is so unique, why should it be shared? It's mine. Well, I think it's funny that I spent so many years studying intellectual property where you were looking at protection, but with these, with these, with these skills, with this savoir faire, with, with craft, it's living and it belongs to a community. So no one really owns it. And in a way, it's also global and it's universal. And there's so many different branches of it, as we've discovered this afternoon. You know, we're not unique in Thailand dying indigo. The Japanese aren't unique. You know, in Vietnam, Kilomet has a phenomenal kind of catalog and recording and know how and of making. So I think it's this idea that we must ensure together that it can evolve. But evolution also means being relevant. And what happens when the community themselves don't want to wear indigo anymore or ikat for that matter? And how do we ensure its evolution? And that's a question that comes under challenges. I'll address that in a little bit. A little bit. And there's also creating visibility for it, a market. There's another artisan that we work with. When we first started speaking with her, she said to me, I don't want you to buy any of my textiles to put in a museum you know, in the West. I think you just need to wear my textiles. You have to wear what I make. And we've always taken that to heart that we must be wearing these. These textiles, these crafts don't necessarily belong in museums. They belong on our, on us. So, you know, then I think it's telling the stories, sharing the process, creating and collaborating often, and knowing that we can grow. One community becomes multiple communities and it can grow. We're not in it alone. So the challenges, the challenges of moving towards this future, I think the first one is this preconception that everything has to be perfect, that everything has to be uniform. Actually, you know, it's slow and imperfect. It's human made, it's not machine made. So it does require a shift in understanding of the consumer, as well as requiring a shift to consuming less perhaps, but of better quality. Maybe we have to relearn that something which is broken doesn't need to be thrown away, but it can be mended. That's where the Japanese burrow comes from. That's where patchworking comes from. That's where so many of our crop skills comes from. We're not wasting and throwing away. We're actually you know, cherishing our love-worn items and mending it, being able to pass it on. And then, you know, I think communicate, communicating the intrinsic value of preserving. And so this was something that I learned from the Climate Futures Conference in December. And it was by Marianne Pastoral Roches, who talked about prioritizing complexity over simplicity. So these skills, this knowledge, none of it is easy. ECAT weaving is not easy and creating abstract patterns from the resist dying of thread and then weaving it on a loom by hand. There is nothing simple about that. It's extremely complex. Yet we are somehow in this fast moving world trained to simplify our process. I don't think it's about simplifying the process. It's about simplifying the way that we communicate the process and what we do. And I think this is something that, you know, language barriers create that desire or impetus to simplify. But you know, that comes under the challenge of communications, but maybe this is something that AI could actually 
be good for, you know, who knows, but the future is something that, that should, we should not be forced to simplify our histories and our narratives and make them conform to a very singular way of how fashion, fashion has kind of moved or production for that matter. And, you know, it's one of those things, I don't know whether it's early to say, but is it, is it a threat to the norm? Is it a threat to big profits? And, you know, sometimes I think a challenge of moving towards this future is also the stereotypes that people have towards things that are made in our region or things that are made by hand or things that are circular or regenerative. And it's tight cost into a certain way. And then the question I ask sometimes on a broader level, is it, is it because it's actually a threat to the version of development that we've adopted certainly in Thailand since post-World War II? You know, but that is a question. So towards an artisanal future and how does my practice, our practice, you know, um, kind of move towards that? And what does it mean? So the strategy, process, collaborative small batch, you know, kind of how all of us working with artisans work. I think communications, I mentioned before, it's communicating complexity simply, but it's also being multifaceted. You know, it's basically learning sometimes the techniques that this generation teaches us and not being fearful of embracing new technology when it comes to that. I think for us, the difference, certainly for Philip as a design director, is what we make must be functional and it must be transitional in that it is for multiple uses. It's for multiple occasions. And we put here, it's a uniform because in our process and practice, we work a lot with artists and, you know, it becomes sort of their uniform. So it's this idea of it suiting one person perfectly, but also being able to, to design for everybody. So it informs the way that our shapes work, where it's like a little bit exaggerated as opposed to tight. It's not like Balenciaga oversized because that's not for everybody. But you see that I think intergenerational is really important for us. So I think that's something that's, that's kind of about the brand. And then, you know, community, we're not in it alone. You know, being here in this conference also really reinforces that. So I'm grateful. And that knowing that allies and collaborators can come in all different shapes and forms. And I think the idea of, you know, the market, there's big markets and small markets, some that we can control, some that we can collaborate with. But I think, you know, another point that Tao made, and I couldn't agree more, is that there is no exit plan. So working with other humans, working in the artisanal realm, knowing that there is an alternative, there is no exit plan to it. I think we, it's the idea is that we grow old together. So I thought that it would be interesting just to add this quote from Professor Cornish, who was a really renowned intellectual property professor, and he really informed the way that I thought about intellectual property. And it's related to the market. So this is actually specifically about trademarks and copyright, but market power may grow out of branding. What does that mean? You know, how does that relate to fashion? I mean, I think it's kind of everything, right? It's perception because the desire to consume, the desire to buy, the desire to support comes out of branding. What is branding but the communications of an idea, the communications of what it is that we make and the brand that represents it. So, you know, I guess what the, how it informs Philip Huang on the kind of fashion front, we see ourselves as a vehicle. Fashion is the way that that, that, that we express what the artisans do. It, in a way, Philip comes from fashion. I dabbled in fashion. It, it was easier in a way to go into that realm. We also love fashion than make furniture, for example. So what you see in the first picture is a collaboration with Echo Leather. And, you know, leather really in a way is one of the most industrialized, polluting industries. But there, that's why there's always scope for making better leather or making better things. And, you know, what better than echoes dry tan technology which consumes very little water dyed with con indigo by hand without using any, any chemical kind of mordants you know so I think there's this idea of pushing the boundary with materiality but also when you think of Southeast Asian fashion or Thai fashion at that mind you we the brand was born when we were living in America and Philip is American but he's Chinese um I think there's always this middle way of 
assessing or looking at what design is. And I think for us, it is minimal, it is functional, it is transitional. And we found it to be the best canvas to be able to communicate that these colors are natural. They're from plants. So the yellow is from mango, the green is from um, indigo with mango over dye. These are from a few of a few of the villages in Sikonakan. And I think this slide is important to communicate that ECAT textiles, very traditional. We all share it in the region. How do we communicate the complexity of ECAT? So Tilda Swinton has been, I think, universally a huge supporter of the artisan and things that are made by hand. And over the years, I've collaborated with her a few times since a film festival that I did many years ago. And this is a robe that Philip made for her and that she wears. And what you can see is within the fabric of the robe itself, you've got, it enabled us to explain how ECAT works and the patterns that are in ECAT and how those tell stories. So, you know, I think this, so so with our artisanal pieces, which we found at the very, very beginning, no one really understood, but this is where allies and collaborators are important. And we've been able to communicate the complexity of artisanal work through our friends, the support of our friends. And this is just a little snapshot of some of the pieces that, some of the things that we do. So for example, you see there's a picture of me with the artist Rikrit Tiravanija. Rikrit wears this workwear jacket, you know, that is based on the blue de travail from the Industrial Revolution in France. So he has a version that's made in Japan, but he wanted a version that was made in Sekonokan Indigo. And we loved it so much that it became, it's actually a well in demand piece that we have every season. So like Tao, we do, it's seasonless where it's the capsule that keeps evolving, but understanding that there is a huge market for the seasons, we also develop seasonally as well. Um, and see the socks that I have there. So if we talk about evolution, we talk about who is actually wearing this stuff. I feel like the socks have were our saving grace during COVID. Thailand is actually a big socks manufacturing country. So we can't claim to produce all the thread and all the textiles. And that's what we use in our collections. But again, this hybrid model, but you know, the socks also, the the, the younger boys, that typically wouldn't help their grandmas are helping us dye our socks. You know, the little five-year-old granddaughter of Masa'at, she dyes a lot of our socks and it's like a hobby for her. It's fun and it's not labor, this is craft. So there are different things, right? I mean, so I think the idea of accessibility, we want to make clothes that everyone can wear that celebrates the artisan, but the next generation of artisans who wear Nike and Adidas and want to wear sneakers all day, maybe, tie-dyed socks speak to them more than a sarong. And um, lastly, there's, there's a shirt there. And that's just an example of a collaboration that we did with a Thai designer, Sean Puipia, who graduated from Antwerp, extremely talented and multidisciplinary. So we, we do this in that way where that's what I meant by a vehicle for a collaboration. So, you know, we're very open to that. And I guess, I probably am almost out of time, but or out of time already. But I just wanted to end with this note that perhaps many of us can kind of relate to. But it's a vision that Philip and I always had. And maybe it's, you know, and it's this idea that we live in the city, but we dream in the countryside. And drawn from the past in harmony with the land is a vision, a vision for a future that that can exist and that's an artisanal future. And that's it. Thank you very much, Daniela and Chong Wan. I enjoyed that very much. In fact, I enjoyed the conference today a lot. There's so much to think about, um, but I, I know that I am inspired and um, really enjoy the synergy as, as Chong Wan um, talked about. So I'd like to make some closing remarks. And first of all, thank you to all panelists and attendees for joining us for day one of Front and Off Center Fashion and Southeast Asia. So I would like to close the day at the conference thinking about some of the common threads that have started to emerge from the sessions so far, and I have distilled three. The first is the importance of self-fashioning and how this is necessarily based on hybridity. It is interesting how we select from what is available locally, regionally, and globally, and how this is 
a very personal practice that shifts through time and space and can be messy, as Peter and Kiko so eloquently showed us. The individual exercises agency and can choose to conform to belong or resist to make statements or do neither at times to fashion and present the self. Secondly, I'm thinking about the concept of crowdsourcing as an extension of the idea of community. When Weiti and Daniela talked about their practices in the very first session, one of the things that came through was a sense of community. They have worked with an existing community of fashion practitioners in Singapore and through their projects provided spaces, um, whether physical spaces or conceptual spaces to further gather and strengthen this idea of community. And this ran through all the presentations to the end with Chomwan's presentation, where she spoke about allies, I, I like that word, who work together to advance a collective agenda. And thirdly, I observe from this conference, and of course with my work um, in my academic research and my journalistic practice, that there is deep, deep pride in the cultures and knowledge that is available in Southeast Asia, and further ambition and intention in how we can harness this to conceptually negotiate and express our identity through fashion, and more practically, to also make a living. This came through again in all the sessions, but especially in the one with Toton and Tao, where they talked about the research they thoughtfully conduct that then pours into creating work of quality and how they stand their ground to make sure their brands stay true to not only preserving, but actively contributing to what they take inspiration from. I end with Toton's observation that his research has resulted in more questions than answers. As a researcher, this excites me. There is much unlearning we have done and still have to do. With that, I invite everyone to continue learning and unlearning with us tomorrow for day two of Front and Off Center Fashion in Southeast Asia, where we will hear about more practices. We have coming up tomorrow the following sessions, Sustainability in Fashion, Fashion Spreads, Fashion Collectives, Artists and Fashion, and Fashion Photography and Film. In the meantime, I would like to invite you to visit fashionandmarket.net and follow our work on Fashion and Market on Instagram to find out more about fashion and Southeast Asia. See you tomorrow and goodbye for now.